One of my first maths lessons in secondary school was about Pythagoras' theorem. Now, to most people that doesn't sound very scary, but to me it was my worst nightmare, because in order to find the missing side, you have to find the square root. But my pathetic little desktop calculator with big buttons, dual power source, solar and battery, large display screen, perfect for office teachers and students black, didn't have the square root button on it. So I couldn't use it for Pythagoras' theorem. We were doing a whiteboard activity where the teacher writes down a big problem on the whiteboard in front and everyone else writes down their answers on a little whiteboard on their desks. Now I could have just put my hand up and told the teacher that I didn't have a scientific calculator, but I was a little bit autistic so instead I decided to just guess. Root 156? Eh, that's probably like 12.3. Root 89, that's like 9.2, isn't it? So while everyone else was getting the answer right in like two seconds, I was there with my whiteboard, writing down the answer and slowly holding it up just to get the wrong answer, making it look like I had learning difficulties. There is actually a way to calculate square roots of numbers by hand. Let's say, for example, we wanna calculate the square root of 869.2. So first of all, we're going to set up a large bus stop like this, and we're going to put in the number, but we're going to put it in pairs. So starting from the decimal point, we've got the first pair is 69. Now this number here, 8, we're going to pair that up with a leading 0. And then this here, 2, we're also going to do the same thing, pair it up with a leading 0. So you can see we've got three pairs of numbers. Have a look at this first number here. What is the largest square number that is less than 8? The answer is 4, so we're going to put 4 here, and then square root it and put it alongside here. Now we're going to subtract this 4 from the top number, and we should end up with 4. The next step is we're going to drop that down this second pair, 69, to stick onto the end of the 4. So we end up with 469. Now we're going to take this digit here, and we're going to double it. So we're going to get 4, and we're going to put that in the bottom left, just like this. Now we've got a missing space here, and in this missing space is going to be a digit, and when you take this digit and multiply by the entire number, we should end up with a number less than 469. But this digit here has to be the largest digit you possibly could put in, such that this multiplied by this is less than this. So let's say we put in a 9. 49 multiplied by 9 gives us 441, and that is the largest number that we can make. So we're going to subtract that from 469, and we end up with 28. Now we're going to take this 9 and add it to the 49, and we end up with 58 here. We're going to drop this next pair down to the bottom so we get 2820, and we're going to do the same thing again. What digit can go in here that multiplies by the whole number that gives us a number that is just under 2820? And the answer is 4. So we do 584 times by 4, and we end up with 2,336. Now, I could keep going on and on forever and ever, but we've actually already got three digits for our answer, and those three digits are here. This is where our answer appears, and if we put the 29.4 up here, that is actually the square root of this answer to one decimal place, so 29.4, but it's not rounded, it's actually truncated, which means that it's just been cut off, so the real answer is 29.48 blah blah blah, but you can see that that has not been rounded up to a 5, so just be careful of that. Needless to say, when I went home, I practically begged my mum for a scientific calculator, and instead of paying £20 to get a modern scientific calculator off Amazon, she instead went up into the attic and fished out one of these. This is the Casio FX82LB, and it's actually the exact same calculator that my mum used for her economics classes in the 1980s, and it does indeed have a square root button. The problem is, this calculator was still quite difficult to use because of two main reasons. The first being, there is only a single number that can be displayed on the calculator at any given time, so if I wanted to calculate a big long expression, I would have to do it piece by piece. And two, this calculator was almost three times as old as me, so all of the formatting was different to the calculators that my friends had, and not even the teachers knew how to use this calculator. Another year rolls by, and I'm still using this medieval calculator, just barely managing to keep up, until one day, I walk into maths, and I see it just sitting at the back. A Casio FX85 GT+, all by itself. So I walk right up to it, 
and I stole it. Okay, look, I'm not proud of it, but in my defense, it's a beaten up old calculator. The solar panel's even been removed, so I doubt anyone really wanted it that badly. I think someone probably just bought a new calculator and left it there at the back, so I just decided to take it. But nearly every school day for the next four years, I used this same Casio FX calculator, and it still works to this day. And this calculator allowed me to type in expressions, which meant that something that could have taken forever on my old calculator now only takes a couple of seconds. But there's actually a lot more that goes on when you type in the square root of a number on a calculator. A calculator actually uses a different method. If we square root the number x and we want our value y, we're really just raising it to the half power. Now, how a calculator does that is by taking the log of both sides. Because of the way that logs work, we can just move this half over to the front, and we see that y is equal to e to the power of a half ln x, and this is the same as the square root of x. You can also use this same method for finding the nth root of x, but then the question becomes, how does a calculator find the natural log? Maybe if I just hit it with this log, the first thing we need to understand is that calculators don't actually store full numbers just as they are. So if we take this number a for example, let's say a is 869.2, a calculator would actually convert this into standard form, so you get 8.692 times 10 to the 2. But calculators don't actually store numbers like this either, because they don't store numbers in base 10, they store them in base 2 or binary. So you would end up with a mantissa, which is this multiplied by 2 to some power. So this number, for example, 869.2, would actually be stored as 1.6976 times 2 to the power 9. That way, by using our rules of logs, we can split up the natural log here to end up with the natural log of this number plus the natural log of 2 to the power 9. We can take the 9 to the front and we end up with ln 1.6976 plus 9 ln 2. The useful thing about this is that this number here can only ever be between 1 and 2. If we store the natural log of 2, and also we store the natural log of all the numbers from 1 to 2, then we can find the natural log of any other number. If you're a beta male, then you might be thinking, well that's great, I'll just use a McLaren expansion, but the issue with the McLaren expansion is that it starts to diverge pretty badly for values where x is close to 1. So instead, we're going to use something called a Chebyshev polynomial. Chebyshev polynomials are defined as t sub n of x equals cosine of n times cosine minus 1 of x, and when you increase the value of n, you get something that looks a little bit like a spring being compressed. It's important to note here that computers won't actually use this explicit definition of a Chebyshev polynomial only because it uses trigonometric functions here and here, and these are a whole other thing on its own, and I've made a video about how computers actually calculate trigonometric functions. Instead, it will use these recursive definitions up here, which don't require any trigonometric functions. In order to project the Chebyshev polynomial onto our ln of 1 plus x, we're going to stretch this graph, because the only bit that's really important to us is this curve here. So we're going to use ln of x plus 3 over 2 in the interval of minus 1 to 1. Now we're going to change this curve here to match with this curve here. The approximation of f of x can be found by adding together increasing levels of Chebyshev polynomials multiplied by coefficients a. So if I'm going to represent this Chebyshev polynomial as a sum, it looks something like this. It's the sum from 0 to k of a sub n multiplied by t sub n of x. The reason that I've taken the subscripts out and I've used functions to represent them instead is because Desmos doesn't really like using subscripts as parameters. So we're going to define a subscript n as 2 over pi times the integral from minus 1 to 1 of f of x t of n of x all over root 1 minus x squared with respect to x. Now, that is how you find the coefficients. If you're wondering where that came from, just look up orthogonality of Chebyshev polynomials. I'm not going to explain it in this video because it takes way too long. But basically, once you do that, you get a very nice approximation of the ln curve. Very nice. You'll notice that it's a little bit offset, and that's because we have to subtract a sub zero off the end of it. And once we do that, we'll get something that fits basically exactly. The way Chebyshev polynomials work is they minimize the maximum error. 
This is known as minimax. And you'll notice that if I show you the error, that the maximum error is extremely small. So small, in fact, that Desmos just plots it as zero. If we compare this to the McLaren expansion seen in green, we can easily see which is the best approximation. So when you ask your calculator to find the square root of 563, the first step is it will convert it into standard form. 563 equals 1.0996 times 2 to the 9. The next thing it will do is it will try to find the natural log of this number, and it will do this by splitting it up using the logarithm laws into ln of 1.0996 plus 9 lots of the ln of 2. It has the ln of 2 stored in the memory, so it will use that, and then it will try to find the ln of 1.0996 using the Chebyshev polynomials. At this point, it will refine it using the newton raphson method, but we're not going to get into that today. Step 3 is it will use the values obtained from the Chebyshev polynomials to find the natural log of 563. Once it's found this value, it will then half it to get 3.166, and then it will exponentiate it to end up with the value of 23.73, and this is the square root of 563. Now you know how a calculator finds square roots, so you can f off.